afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our first ever and hopefully last virtual fall conference, Jewish Life in New Mexico and Beyond, A Mosaic of Stories. Many of you here this afternoon know that we had originally hoped to hold our conference in Las Cruces, co-sponsored with the Texas Jewish Historical Society. Public health permitting, we hope to hold the 2021 conference in Las Cruces with the original theme, West of Hester Street, the Galveston Movement in Jewish Immigration and Communities in the Southwest. We have attendees today from all over the US and even one time delayed registrant from Israel. Welcome everybody. I wanna say a few words before we get underway this afternoon. First and foremost, I wanna thank all of our behind the scenes fall conference committee members and special shout outs to Marsha Torben, director of the Santa Fe Jewish Film Festival and Marsha Reifman, publications website coordinator at Temple Beth Shalom, George Donahoe Bayless for our press releases and Claudia Bloom, our part-time uh, administrator. A huge, huge thanks to all of our donors with their generous support of this year's fall conference and to the Jewish Federation. You will see their organizational and individual household names throughout the conference. We have a great lineup of program sessions this afternoon and tomorrow, and we sincerely hope you enjoy the show. The conference via Zoom presented us with a challenge, and we sincerely hope that the technology gods will be kind to us this weekend. Next week, after the conference concludes, uh, we will be following up with two communications, one, a general email, and two, a post-conference evaluation sent to each of you via SurveyMonkey, and we hope that many of you will respond. Let me also take a moment, since I have a captive audience here, to put in a membership plug for the Jewish Historical Society. Some of you know, and others not, that we are the only statewide organization devoted to collecting, preserving, and sharing the rich history of Jewish New Mexico from the 16th century to today. In addition to our fall conference and speaker programs, we have an award-winning quarterly newsletter called Legacy, publications, and many other activities and research projects that would not be possible without membership support. So if you're not a member already, we invite you to join. We currently have about 275 memberships. And with your support, we will be able to ensure that New Mexico Jewish history passes from one generation to another. Which leads me to a segue about Lachaim, New Mexico, life and legacy. Uh, NMJHS is one of 10 Jewish organizations in the state participating in this program, sponsored and supported by the Harold Grinspoon Foundation. Lachaim, New Mexico affords each of us uh, to ensure that our Jewish tomorrows for generations to come. For us, what it has meant is given us an opportunity to establish our first ever endowment fund. We are currently in year three of a four year campaign and thank those donors and you saw their names on one of the slides and we'll continue to see them in the break in tomorrow. So without further ado, let me introduce Norma Libman who will in turn introduce our first program session, the Spanish flu in New Mexico and the role of Rabbi Bergman. Norma is a longtime resident of New Mexico, a former journalist for the Chicago Tribune, researcher, author, speaker, lecturer, as well as a former NMJHS board member. So Norma, it's all yours and thank you. Thank you, Linda. It's a pleasure to be here and to uh, start off this conference, which is um, gonna be fantastic, especially this first uh, program, the one that I know about. It is the Spanish flu in New Mexico and the role of Rabbi Bergman. And we have two presenters and I'm gonna give you a little biography of each one and then we will let them take over. Uh, Richard Melzer is originally from Teddy Roosevelt's hometown of Oyster Bay, New York. Dr. Melzer taught history at the University of New Mexico's Valencia ca campus from 1979 
to 2019, retiring as a UNM Regents Professor of History. He is the author, co-author, or editor of more than 100 articles and chapters, as well as more than two dozen books about New Mexico history. Ten of his books, including two about Jewish history, have won major book awards. He is a past two-term president of the Historical Society of New Mexico. Dr. Melzer and his wife, Rena, live in Berlin, New Mexico. And with Richard will be Naomi Sandwise, a past president of the New Mexico Jewish Historical Society and author of Jewish Albuquerque, 1860 to 1960. Her articles regularly appear in various Jewish publications. Naomi is employed as executive director of Parents Reaching Out, a nonprofit organization, and she is a parent of two young adult children. Um, as we go through this presentation, if you have questions, if you will put them into the chat box at any time. And at the end of the presentation, um, Naomi will address those questions uh, as many as she can. She and Richard will answer. Uh, you should keep your mics muted unless um, uh, Naomi asks you to unmute during the question time. And if there are any uh, problems, anybody encounters a problem, you can send a private message for, in the chat box to Marsha uh, and she will be able to pick that up. Uh, so without further ado, we, I would like to introduce Richard Melzer and Naomi Sandwise. and Richard will be first. Well, thank you, Norma. We appreciate that. It's a pleasure to be with you today. We're going to discuss a, a very sad, tragic incident in American history, but uh, very relevant, of course, to today, the Spanish flu uh, pandemic. Before we begin, I thought I'd make a disclaimer. Uh, I am a doctor, a PhD, not a medical doctor. So if we have questions, scientific or medical questions uh, in, in our discussion later, I'm not the one to help you out, I'm sorry to say, but we'll do the best we can otherwise. Uh, the Spanish flu epidemic in 1918 was the worst epidemic in American history. It uh, killed uh, many, many people, of course. Here in New Mexico, uh, we estimate that about 15,000 people caught the flu and at least 1,000 people died of the flu. It's really hard to talk to any family uh, who was here in 1918 it didn't have at least one person in the family uh, affected by the, the flu. On a personal level, I wasn't here, but my mother, who was seven years old at the time, uh, she had the flu, and thank goodness, I'm very grateful that uh, she, she survived. It's uh, a very uh, unusual flu, a very unusual epidemic for three main reasons. Uh, first of all, because they call it the Spanish flu epidemic, which it, it, we can't blame it on the Spanish or any Spanish people in the world. Uh, it's a misnomer, and I wish I had time to explain uh, why that's true, but uh, it's, it's, it certainly can't be attributed to the, the Spanish in any way. The second thing that makes it unique is it's, uh, it, was, it struck in October and November of 1918, and we all know the regular flu season is in January and February. So those poor people went through this terrible pandemic in uh, late 1918, and then they went through the regular uh, epidemic flu season in early 1919. And the third reason it's, it's unusual uh, in, in uh, the history of disease is because when we think of disease, we usually think of people affected who are very young or very old, very susceptible. But in this one, it affected people between the ages of, of 20 and 45 in particular. And again, I wish we had more time, maybe we will later to uh, understand why that particular uh, group. But you know, this is the tail end of World War I and it was so significant. These people of course are relied on as the, the backbone of our military and our workforce and here they're being affected uh, most of all. So our, our goal today is to take a, a look at, discuss beginnings of the flu epidemic in New Mexico, uh, to look at its um, the reaction of people here in dealing with the epidemic and finally, the, the impact, the effect 
of the epidemic. And then I'll hand it off to Naomi, who will be more specific, of course, about the situation here in Albuquerque with uh, uh, Rabbi Bergman. So the first reported cases of the epidemic here in New Mexico was in, were, were in Carlsbad. And it came in uh, 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 reportedly uh, with a, a circus from Texas and uh, uh, through West Texas coming up the Pecos River Valley into Carlsbad. Uh, one of the owners of the, the circus and some of the performers in the circus had the disease. And, and sure enough, when people went to the circus uh, the, uh, in that crowd, uh, they caught it and it spread very quickly through, through Carlsbad and then uh, through the rest of New Mexico. Especially, like I said, at the end of the war with so many people involved in the war, so many people moving around, especially on the railroad, but, but in general, uh, soldiers moving from place to place, workers, uh, th these were the most susceptible, uh, the railroad towns in, in particular. Although it was impossible to escape. You now you would think uh, New Mexico with its scattered population, small population, uh, you go off into the, onto the mesa and you'd be okay. But that wasn't the case. Uh, very isolated people also got, got the flu. In fact, in the whole world, uh, they, the population that had the um, most uh, uh, largest percentage of the flu was the, uh, the South Pacific Islands. So you couldn't even go to the islands and, and, and escape it. So the, the reaction uh, were first by the government, uh, our governor was uh, Governor Washington Lindsay. He uh, shut down all public gatherings, all public places, including houses of worship and schools, including UNM. And of course, in those days, we couldn't go online. So they really were shut down. Our restaurants and, and uh, bars, movies, dance halls, uh, courthouses, crowds of any kind. And this was difficult, especially at the end of the war, November 11th, people uh, heard at the end of the war, and, they, and the first thing they did was go out in the streets and get in crowds. And uh, of course, that didn't uh, help the situation at all. And eventually, people uh, fought the flu uh, with patent medicines. Every patent medicine, I think, uh, claimed that it could prevent or fight the, the flu. Of course, that usually wasn't the case. Many people had uh, homemade re remedies, uh, including uh, herbs. Many Hispanics tried to use herbs to fight the flu. Many people thought that eating lemons, fresh lemons, would make a difference. My, my, my favorite is that people, uh, some people thought that eating onions would help. And I think that strategy there was if you ate onions, no one would come get near you and uh, you wouldn't catch the flu. But uh, none of that worked uh, very effectively. Uh, the most effective means of, of uh, fighting the flu, or, uh, try, try not to spread it or to or, or, or to get the flu was wearing masks, just like today, wearing masks. And, and usually it was voluntary. Uh, most people uh, did wear masks, especially in the cities. Uh, sometimes it was required, for example, in Taos it was re required. And, uh, uh, and, and it's the same uh, 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 material, gauze material that had been used to make bandages in World War I. Uh, many volunteering to do that, especially through the Red Cross. Now they turned around and uh, made the masks in and, 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 uh, and huge quantities, especially through uh, Red Cross volunteers. It's interesting as we go through this political campaign this year, uh, the, uh, to know that 1918, it wasn't a presidential election, but it was a congressional election. And uh, so they, they called it off. They called off all public uh, 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 gatherings regarding the, the uh, uh, politics. Uh, especially after the Republican Party met earlier in the fall, in October, and uh, 22 members of the convention uh, caught the flu. So right after that, they, they called them all, all off. And of course, uh, they, they did eventually develop a, a serum, uh, and, but it was too little and too late. It was not uh, very effective uh, here, in especially, especially in, in New Mexico. So the, uh, the, the results, uh, first of all, doctors and nurses were overwhelmed. They were outnumbered. Many of them were in the military at the time and uh, otherwise busy during the, uh, the, the war. Uh, those were here, doctors and nurses and volunteers, many of them caught the disease and uh, suffered and, and uh, some of them died. Um, the hospitals were overwhelmed. This sounds familiar. Uh, in, in this case, they didn't need intensive care units. They used, sometimes used uh, buildings like schools uh, for the overflow. 
It was said here in New Mexico it was so bad that the church bells rang day and night, announcing the deaths of uh, people in, in the towns and villages. Uh, the, the, um, they said that there's so many people that they had wagons that they brought down the streets and they, they simply brought the dead out into the wagons to be brought to the cemeteries, very seldom going to churches or houses of worship or at any, any ceremonies. Uh, what, uh, the, once they were in the wagons, they didn't have enough wood. They couldn't build the coffins fast enough, so they ran out of wood, and they had mass graves. It's interesting. In many cemeteries, you go around New Mexico, uh, you, you look and if, if someone died, and if they were in their 20s and 30s, and they died in October, November 1918, you can't jump to the conclusion they died of the flu, but it's a very likely possibility, very likely possibility. And by the way, we should mention uh, that uh, you died of the flu or its complications, especially pneumonia. And, and it, it happened very fast. Uh, it, uh, you very often caught the flu uh, or pneumonia uh, with the complications in the morning and by the evening uh, you, you had passed away. So many mass graves, you see individual graves, but uh, you would see, expect to see many more individual graves. The, the, the reality was uh, they had mass graves especially bad in towns like Gallup and Belen, uh, Socorro, and very much like today with our poor health infrastructure for Native Americans, the Navajo reservation suffered terribly. Uh, many uh, Mexican immigrant communities suffered badly, especially down on the border by Mesilla and Deming and uh, Carlsbad. And very often it's like today, uh, they didn't have access to uh, uh, health care, and very often lived in very congested areas, uh, which meant that uh, they, they were um, uh, much more susceptible. Crowded conditions. Uh, the flu finally ended by December, but wouldn't you know, then we went into the regular flu season. And so there was another spike, not as bad as the first spike, but still uh, very bad uh, for the regular flu season. It played out, especially among that's a very vulnerable population, in, including, uh, or especially the, the very young. I should also mention some other people who got the flu. Kaiser Wilhelm got the flu. Some people thought that the flu was caused by German chemical warfare. <laughs> uh, but apparently, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm got it. Uh, uh, Witter Wilson apparently had the flu during the uh, Versailles peace negotiations. And uh, a future president named uh, Franklin Roosevelt had the flu, but uh, thank goodness uh, they, they all survived and uh, went on with, with, with their lives. So that's, that's my presentation. I, I surrender my last two minutes to Naomi <laughs> and she's gonna tell us about uh, conditions here in Albuquerque and the great work of Rabbi Bergman, Naomi. Thank you, Richard. Um, and Marsh is gonna be pulling up my PowerPoint momentarily. Um, I'm going to be looking at specifically the Jewish reaction to the pandemic of 1918 and um, primarily focusing in on Albuquerque as the community that um, we're addressing. And Albuquerque at the time had a population of about 15,000 of which um, about 225 people were Jewish. So just to give you context, a pretty small part of the population. Um, but let's look outside of Albuquerque for a moment. In other communities across the state, um, Santa Fe, Las Vegas, um, Las Cruces, um, and even Deming, um, Camp Cody outside of Deming, there were certainly Jewish individuals um, Marsha, if you can go to the third slide, please. So two more, yeah, there we go. There were definitely Jewish populations, but there wasn't the kind of organizational infrastructure that there was in Albuquerque. So I have some population numbers here and when some of the congregations were founded, but suffice it to say that in addition to Albuquerque, Las Vegas, which had a congregation, Montefiore, had no rabbi um, since the summer of 1918, by autumn of 1918. Um, and then Las Cruces, there was not a congregation, but they were served by a rabbi out of El Paso, 
unfortunately, that rabbi's son died on October 19th, his six month old son. So there, in terms of the um, people power to really um, build infrastructure and serve the victims of the flu and prevent it, there wasn't a whole lot of Jewish um, presence other than Rabbi Moise Bergman. And I also want to mention that, you know, as Richard said, we're talking about October and November, primarily 1918, the high holidays that year were early. They took place in September 7th and 16th. So we didn't have as much interaction there. Um, Marcia, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, just as context, another deadly disease was um, alive and well in the state of New Mexico at the same time, which was TB. Um, the state had quarantine um, and other resources for treating people with TB throughout this, for tuberculosis throughout the state. And so one of the organizations that fought that disease was the Board of Charities. It was established by the legislature in 1882. And the Board of Charities in Albuquerque worked on um, providing food and medicine to a TB colony of people in the city. And that TB colony actually was transformed into a makeshift flu hospital when the pandemic started to hit in August, 1918, and then, and then grew to serve more. Next slide, please. Rabbi Moise Bergman was at Congregation Albert. He was originally um, from Louisiana and attended Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati. And he actually switched pulpits with a classmate, Congregation um, Albert, uh, Rabbi Mendel Silber. So they switched pulpits. Rabbi um, Moise Bergman came to Albuquerque and Rabbi Silber went to Louisiana. And um, Moise Bergman shortly began chairing the Albuquerque Board of Charities. So he was already in a position where he was um, providing um, ecumenical support and infrastructure to those um, working on the TB problem in Albuquerque and then turning their attention to those who had the flu. And in addition to building the infrastructure, he was also raising funds for those orphaned and widowed. Um, he raised $10,000, which as you can imagine in 1918 was an enormous amount of money um, to support those who had been impacted by the flu. And as Richard said, the flu um, hit fast and quick and often people in the prime of their life. So um, there were many who were left in a position of being widowed or orphaned. Next slide, please. So as Richard mentioned, the governor um, enacted a chlorine quarantine in um, October of 1918. But by that time, Albuquerque had already enacted a partial quarantine. Schools, the university, the railroad, businesses, place, places of worship, and indoor meetings were already closed. Um, the city officials were particularly concerned that, as Richard mentioned, people were getting on the railroad in Winslow or Gallup and getting off in Albuquerque already infected with the flu and potentially spreading it. And so um, the railroad being closed was a major issue because as you well know, the railroad was how um, many uh, individuals, including many Jewish people in business at the time made their living from the visitors who came and purchased items from their stores or shopped in their um, bakeries and how they moved their uh, merchandise around was by railroad. So this was not a small situation. And by and large at the time, the makeup of Congregation Albert and most of the Jews in the state at the time were merchants. So this was a, an incredible hit. Um, I have just something to read real quick. This was from October 20th and it describes the quarantine at the time. This is from the Albuquerque Morning Journal. The kiddies have enjoyed a week of freedom. The movie patrons have had a choice to discover what an evening at home is like. And today the faithful churchgoers are being given an opportunity to stay at home without framing up an alibi. It's all due to the Spanish flu. No one knows how long it will last, but until further notices, churches, schools, clubs, and other places of public gathering will be closed. So um, much like today, um, only for a much shorter time, 
the um, quarantine um, impelled people to stay at home. Next slide, please. There was a controversy between the rabbi and many of his congregants about that quarantine. So um, Rabbi Bergman was very much in favor of the quarantine. He says here, it's hard to answer a man who says his business has been hurt by the quarantine, but it will be impossible to answer the one who says my child has died because of the neglect of the state. Does that sound familiar? And then um, J.A. Weinman, who is the proprietor of a business called Golden Rule Dry Good Companies, um, said further restriction is entirely useless. Um, but I, I threw in a part of an ad from Golden Rule. They were really focused on out of town business. And in fact, in their ad, it says out of town folks find a special welcome at the Golden Rule store. So the very heart of the business of many of the congregants was, was uh, at issue here. Um, the store itself, Golden Rule, was located at 3rd and Central, so very much right by the railroad. Next slide, please. Richard mentioned that the Armistice Parade, which took place in um, November, was uh, quite the um, temporary end to the quarantine in Albuquerque and over New Mexico. As you can see here, practically entire city turns out to make merry. So there was um, a lot of potential spread of the flu in um, the beginning of November. Next slide, please. Um, I don't want to give the impression that only Albuquerque, and, and somebody asked and will address some of the language in the newspaper later, that was of the time, um, but Albuquerque wasn't the only place that Jewish individuals lived and died of the flu. Camp Cody was a camp, an army training camp outside of Deming. Um, they were known as the Sandstorm Group because they, um, the, the nature of the climate there. But um, there were soldiers who were stationed there, including uh, Sergeant David Rosenwald, who died there. And um, the, um, the rabbi, Rabbi Bergman, would, he, he didn't, um, actually officiate, um, no, he did officiate at that funeral and he went down for the funeral of the rabbi's son that I mentioned in El Paso. So although they were concerned with general quarantine and closing the railroad, individuals did travel to do things like conduct funerals. Um, so that, that definitely happened. Um, what was the impact and legacy of both Rabbi Bergman and um, some of these closures and the situation in Albuquerque and the rest of the state. Well, first of all, the there was no health department in New Mexico at the time of the flu. We were one of only two states at the time that didn't have one. And early in 1919, that, that changed. So a New Mexico health department was organized. As for Bergman, he was so popular, he tried to resign his pulpit in 1920, but the congregation would not accept it. Um, and in fact, there is a wonderful quote in the book by Erna Ferguson in her book about Albuquerque in which she talks about the fact that the rabbi had extra, uh, the, the group on charities, the ecumenical group in New Mexico had money on hand. And um, the priest, Father Mandelari, said that gentlemen and ladies, I move you to that the extra money should be used to buy a Christmas present for Rabbi Bergman in jest and good humor. And Rabbi Bergman, equally popular and quick, it's written, leapt to his feet. No, 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 I have a substitute motion. I move, Mr. Chairman, that we apply this surplus to the purchase of a wedding present for Father Mandelari. Um, and I, I give you that to indicate that there was incredible cooperation and goodwill um, between the um, between the different religious leaders in Albuquerque to fight the flu. They were united in their efforts through this Albuquerque Board of Charities. Ultimately, Bergman did leave New Mexico. He took a pulpit, pulpit in Pueblo and later he led a San Diego congregation. Um, but his legacy really lived on in terms of um, being a voice for the people who did not otherwise have a voice 
um, fighting the flu, and especially those who found themselves in extremely dire circumstances. So Richard and I are happy to take questions. I see there's been a little activity on the chat already about um, some of the language in the paper um, from 1917 and 1918. Um, but I, I see um, some comments, sounds familiar, and of course it is. Um, but there was one question Robert Gale asked, are there any of these mass graves, Richard, visible still in New Mexico after um, the flu epidemic in 1918? I'm sorry, were there any, what? Um, um, Robert wants to know, are, were there any of these mass graves, are they still um, yes. visible? Well, they're, they're visible uh, right south of our campus in Tomei. Uh, there's a, a, a large empty space, and uh, it is apparently the, a mass grave from the, uh, the, the epidemic. Many cemeteries, of course, have grown or been uh, moved, so that there aren't that many, but uh, we, there are some. The next question, and this, this may take um, this again, maybe more of a medical question, but how different were Spanish flu or so-called Spanish flu symptoms from the traditional flu that was known? Here's my disclaimer. Uh, apparently uh, 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 very much the same, uh, but worse because they're very deadly. And it, uh, it, it, it developed so fast into pneumonia and became fatal for so many. I, I should have mentioned, uh, I neglected to mention that uh, four times as many people died of the flu in New Mexico as died in World War I. That's how terrible it was here. And Richard, I believe that the Native American, you, um, you alluded to this, but the Native American population suffered at even higher numbers than the overall population. Yes. Yeah. So um, another question that came up is, were there any anti-mask or anti-quarantine protests? Not that we know of here in New Mexico. The uh, most famous one uh, organization was the anti-mask uh, organization out in San Francisco. And uh, uh, that only happened in January of 1919. And it was a, a very slow movement. And it was interesting. It, it didn't have anything to do with their constitutional rights, the rights of privacy about wearing masks. It had to do with their belief, this, this organization's belief, that uh, they didn't do any good. In fact, it was unsanitary to, to, to wear a mask. Uh, that some people said that uh, trying to contain the flu with a mask was like trying to contain a fly with barbed wire. <laughs> mm. One question that came up, weren't there any Jewish doctors in Albuquerque? And actually at that time, most of the Jewish doctors who came to Albuquerque actually came later on um, at the, around the beginning of the Second World War and afterwards. And so um, at the time, most of the doctors who came to Albu who were in Albuquerque were actually here to treat tuberculosis and work in the sanitariums. So um, that treated those patients. So. Um, there may have been a Jewish doctor or two, but they, no one has shown up in the literature anywhere that I've seen. Um, another question, how many, that was addressed, how many people died of the flu in general and in New Mexico in particular? And I think Richard had mentioned, we know of about a thousand victims in New Mexico. Um, and then how long did the pandemic last? Um, Richard, I believe that most of the, um, the, the highest incidents were in October and November. Right. Do you want to, anything else related to that? Uh, no, not really. Okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to get through the question. Weren't sure. there um, subsequent issues, um, episodes of Spanish flu in later years? And everybody, Richard, really wants to know why was it titled Spanish, Spanish flu? flu. <laughs> So could you address that, please? Well, uh, it's very interesting. Spain, of course, was neutral during World War I. And so uh, the, the newspapers, the press in Spain could share a lot of the information about the pandemic in Europe, uh, while other newspapers in Europe, especially in England and, and France, 
uh, they, their news was censored. So most of the news was coming out of, of Spain. In, in fact, in, in, in England, the, the government was accused, or at least some officials were accused of suppressing news of the flu uh, so that they, uh, they wouldn't interfere with the end, end of the war. Uh, so the news came out of Spain. And so many people thought uh, that that was the origin of the, here in New Mexico, uh, in the United States, the origin apparently was Fort Riley, Kansas. They should have called it the Kansas flu epidemic. <laughs> and Richard, didn't you write about the fact that there was some vigilante activity in New Mexico around travel when, um, when groups encountered trains or travelers that they thought might be spreading the flu? Can you talk about that at all? Right, not, not to the point of violence, but uh, uh, towns, towns were interesting. Uh, Albuquerque and, and especially my town of Valen, when trains came in from at, out of state, they would uh, uh, they, they would uh, uh, make sure that uh, the the uh, natives, the re local residents, could get off the train, but not other people, which was crazy because just because they were from Valen didn't mean they they weren't carrying the the uh, the the the, uh, the, 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 uh, the flu uh, from other people on the train. But uh, it, it was very confusing, much like today. Uh, and that's a de definite reason, as Naomi said, for the creation of the uh, Department of Health, State Department of Health. They, they realized the lack of information sharing numbers and, and uh, coordination. And that was the only good thing that really came out of the, uh, the, the flu pa pandemic. One of the other things that I think is really similar that we didn't mention is that healthcare workers suffered. Um, it especially, um, I had mentioned Camp Cody, the nurses there um, it got the flu in, in incredible numbers. Um, and so much like today, those frontline personnel really um, were, were very impacted incredibly. Um, they had a number of deaths um, from um, healthcare workers who were treating people with the flu. Um, was there a backlash in the country of people of Spanish, um, so-called Spanish origin um, in relation to the flu because it was called Spanish, much like we saw you know, recently with um, the origin of the COVID? And then um, were there any conspiracy theories about the flu? So- it's a very good question. I, I've never heard of any backlash against uh, uh, the Spanish here in, in New Mexico or in other places like Texas or, or, or California. Uh, there were conspiracy theories, uh, especially that one about the, the Germans, uh, not another group, and they weren't to be taken seriously, of course. Another group thought there was so much hate in the world as a result of uh, World War I that it just became a disease. All crazy stuff, of course. And I think the other thing that, that you alluded to, but 1918, like this year, was an election year. And so it, um, while the governor was not nominated by his party for re-election, and it was a gubernatorial election that year, um, there was a lot of movement as well, probably before October, um, for, you know, in terms of election related issues. Um, one other question, what could have been, what was done to help people? And my understanding was primarily the treatment was um, just keeping people comfortable. And there's, there's a horrible description I have of um, somebody walking into the Pueblo of Isleta and the the uh, victims and what they were going through. But Richard, were there other treatments other than the quackery that you mentioned that were more um, considered standard for treating patients? Gen generally uh, treating it much like the regular flu and pneumonia when it became pneumonia, uh, no nothing uh, unusual there, uh, given the, the knowledge of um, uh, medicine and procedures at the time. Um, and then the next question, was the public aware that Wilson had the flu and who ran the country during his illness? And he never, Wilson never admitted to having the flu. He never spoke once about the flu during his presidency in, in, and, and the pandemic. So right. just to give you that historical context, and Richard, I don't know if you've something to add to that. Well, it, it was said that during the uh, uh, peace conference at Versailles that he developed the flu 
and uh, eventually recovered from it. But it was said that he was never the same after that. Uh, Noel, maybe you could help us with this, but he was never the same as a, a forceful leader in uh, negotiating the treaty. Well, it may have set up, he, he would later have a stroke. Yes. And uh, that really incapacitated him. And that was really kept secret, particularly by his wife who became the middle person, <laughs> the middle woman uh, between the White House and the public. And it could be that the flu set up this other medical episode. Sure. I haven't seen anything definitive, but uh, there may have indeed been a relationship. One other question was, was there a, um... Was there a vaccine being developed um, it, somewhere in New Mexico for the flu? And and I'm I don't know, Richard. Do you? It wasn't developed here in New Mexico, but it was developed by the end of the year. And I'll, I'll uh, uh, it's prophylactic. 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 Yeah. But like I said, a very little available and very late at the end of the year. So not very accessible, especially to uh, people here in New Mexico, especially in isolated areas. Somebody had mentioned um, the book, The Great Influenza um, by John Barry, which is a very good book if you want the whole big long story um, uh, worldwide about influenza in 1918. It I can only imagine how many books we're gonna have. Yes in the future about our year. Well, there's and so many books now about the flu of 1918 comparing it to the pandemic today. So somebody asked, so um, basically, sorry, shout out to my cousin in suburban Washington who asks, so basically herd immunity was achieved. I guess you would say that all those who were susceptible either got it and recovered or died. And in a populate, population like ours, that of course wasn't as dense or as many, uh, it wasn't uh, quite quite as bad. I'll see if there are any other questions. We should mention that uh, you know uh, Naomi was good enough to tell us the population of, of Albuquerque at the time in New Mexico. The population in 1920 uh, was uh, 360,000 people. So a couple questions here. Was there an original source similar to how people think that Wuhan, China was the, the epicenter of COVID? And um, then one more question after that. Well, apparently, we don't know the uh, original source, at least I don't, but apparently the soldiers who were coming back went to Fort Riley and then it spread from Fort Riley here, here in the United States at least. And then of course we can blame the Texans and for the circus and Carlsbad. We get to blame the Texans for a lot. Yeah. And um, Robert Gale points out the herd immunity resulted in 20 to 50 million people dying right. worldwide, which was um, just unbelievable. So another question, when you talk about isolated areas of New Mexico, are you referencing towns off the train lines or more or further out? And I think we're talking about both here because there were deaths in isolated Pueblos that were nowhere near the train lines. Right. A famous incident in Torrance County, there were eight people in a farm family and uh, uh, they hadn't, no one had seen them for a couple of weeks. So they went out for a welfare visit and uh, uh, five of them were sick and the other three were dead by the time they got there. Completely isolated. I think it was out by Chilili. Hmm. Well, thank you, uh, Richard and Naomi. We're right on time here. And I think that's the last question that I see there too. Uh, very informative. And we have are going to have um, about five minutes for a break. We're gonna start again uh, at three o'clock promptly. I believe that's correct. So um, there will be some pictures and information on the screen, but we'll all take about a five minute break here. Thank you very much, Richard and Naomi. Our pleasure.